stuff going on at the state level. Um, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, a serious opportunity to develop Southeast Florida's region um, into the mobility hub internationally that uh, uh, everybody would like it to evolve into. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Widener next. Um, when I was trying to put together uh, this panel and I needed a moderator, as you've heard, um, Jeff has been at this in the Southeast Florida area for over 10 years. And uh, in his position at the Office of Modal Development, he gets to see across a series of transportation modes or activities, no silo. And so the perfect person to address the modes, whether it be rail or ports or other freight um, vehicles, pardon the pun. Um, Jeff was the person to help frame that set of issues for the region. So I would ask you to welcome Jeff Widener. And if, <clears throat> and if the panel members would make their way to the stage, um, we could um, solve the stage management problem. Well, I'm extremely flattered. I think there's a lot of people in this room who don't know who Jeff is. I feel like I'm in a category with Cher. All you need to know is the first name and um, everybody knows who you are. And frankly, what we've done at the district level, and I use the word we, is facilitate. And what David said is yes, um, in the Office of Modal Development at District 4, and working with our PTO partners in District 6, we see a lot of things happening in a lot of different rooms. And just by facilitating and bringing people into the same room, uh, a lot can happen. Um, so I just wanted to um, share with you, in, in the freight world, what is our goal? Our goal is to top our competition. World domination. Um, we have here the big three of cargo in Florida on our team here today. And I'm not talking about LeBron, Chris, and D. Wade, but we're talking about Miami International Airport, Port Everglades, and the Port of Miami. We also have on our team the Florida East Coast Railroad, and together, this is a slam dunk, folks. Uh, we, we got the team. <laughs> you know, um, it was, the Florida Chamber study has been mentioned a couple times. Um, the, the good teams need direction. And what we've taken from here at the DOT from that study is two things, two directives. There's a lot of goods consumed in Florida that are shipped around Florida and trucked and railed hundreds of miles to Florida. 25% in South Florida, 66% from Central Florida North. How do we intercept that trade and bring it into Florida ports and just truck it 30 to 90 miles? Uh, it's environmentally friendly, it just makes sense. We need to attack that um, trade. Secondly, New trade, bring in new trade, the, the trade packs with Colombia, uh, South Korea, and Panama, uh, the global um, uh, logistics of Miami. When I think of uh, Miami, sometimes I think of Hong Kong on the Asian continent, the very southeast corner with access north, south, east, west. We have a lot of opportunity here. Another thing identified in the um, Florida Chamber study I'm not moving, is the six pillars. 
Am I going in the right? All right. Well, the um, trait, the chamber study identified six pillars to a full economy, and this this was a business group that put together a document that somewhat sounds like a planning study. Uh, talent and education are needed, innovation and economic development, infrastructure, a business climate, civic governance, and quality life and quality places. You know, leveraging opportunities means addressing challenges and, and you know, the need for a skilled workforce. Obtaining and maintaining mobility in a highly congested area. Sometimes we just think of the Miami area, the Miami region as a global trading spot and we can't get back and forth to work every day. We need to maintain the mobility, manage the capacity we have now. And, and when you look at today's agenda, transit and freight, some folks might not get the congestion, but con the connection, Freudian slip, <laughs> but <laughs> Freeing up congestion is compatible with keeping what we have now and the ability to grow in the future. So with that, I'm going to introduce our team. Jose, out of the University of Miami. Jose led the state team and led the uh, District 6 team, but then he became a free agent and went on to the Miami International Airport. Um, Jose is overseeing one of the largest expansion programs in the United States. Uh, we've been number one in cargo for a number of years, but Jose, I read in the business section a couple of weeks ago, MIA has just surpassed J JFK as the number one international passenger airport in the country. <laughs> you know, anywhere on the East Coast, finance, uh, trade, transit, beating New York is, is a big deal. The, Real Big Three did it last night. MI Day did it last month in international passenger trade. David Anderton, uh, Dave's one of my colleagues out of Florida State University. Uh, 10 years with Port Everglades overseeing uh, the strategic planning activities. Dave has been really critical here marrying the planning community and the um, business communities at the port. Um, we sometimes call him Dave Master Plan Anderton, but Dave is educated the Florida Seaports Council, the other ports in the state, DOT programming, state funding, coordinating with the MPO requires you plan 5, 10, 15 years. Ports, most of the ports just didn't get that. They need to react to two-year business plans, the changing markets, etc. And, and Dave has educated us on those changes and we frequently work with Dave in moving funds around and changing the flavor of the monies so that we can meet uh, the demands of the seaports. Kevin Linsky, out of Georgetown and Columbia Universities. Uh, Kevin is the point person in Miami-Dade County for the tunnel project and the intermodal project to reconnect the port of Miami. Uh, Kevin formerly was with the U.S. Department of State uh, and he specializes in international business. And rounding out our group, uh, the private sector. Uh, Mark Yoshimura, Mark hails from Chicago, uh, Iowa State, and Purdue. Uh, extensive private sector background, Office Depot North America, and Payless-U International. Um, the connections between our ports and in international or national markets, railroads and roads, and, and it's just great to have the private sector here with uh, all of their practical logistics knowledge. Uh, and with that, um, our program is going to be short presentations. And then uh, if you have questions during the presentations, if you just raise a question card, they'll be collected. I'll sort through the questions uh, as the speakers are moving on, and we'll have a good half an hour of um, question and answer period. So with that, I believe I turn it over to Jose. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. So, Jose. Okay. One out of every four jobs in Miami-Dade County has something to do with uh, Miami International Airport. That's about 282,000 jobs. 
37,000 uh, of them right at, at the airport um, with an economic impact of about $28 billion a year. Our cargo relevance, however, stretches well beyond county lines and it does have an economic ripple effect across our state, nation, and global market. With just over two million tons of freight last year, you can see that the majority of it is international tonnage. We maintain the highest ratio of international to total tonnage of all U.S. airports. Better than 40% of that tonnage is in transit to third countries via MIA. Our import, import versus export tonnage is almost balanced, which is very unique, um, not just within among trade communities, but in fact among, among most nations. Trade values have soared, hitting the 62 billion with a B mark last year and rising over $10 billion annually for the last three years. And when we compare MIA against the rest of our state uh, air, and even combined sea trade values, we see what a cargo powerhouse it really is. <clears throat> MIA's role in the Americas in air cargo is what sets us uh, apart from, uh, from other airports. But increasingly, we also serve as connecting hub to markets in Europe, Asia, and points around the world. In international freight, we have maintained our number one status among US airports for many years. And lead cargo giants such as New York, JFK, LAX, and Chicago. Among the world's top 10, we maintain a prominent place as well. To stay in pace with our growing cargo volumes, our cargo facilities have grown, grown beyond the west side of MIA into the northwest side and most recently breaking ground in the northeast corner as well. A new next generation facility is now under construction in the northeast quadrant and will be the headquarters, a new center of cargo operations for Centurion Cargo. This project adds jobs to the economy and capacity to the airport's warehouse and freighter parking inventory. My, maintaining MIA's standing as a premier cargo hub will require balancing some important factors as we move forward. From measuring and keeping ahead of the competition to completing our master plan study that is now underway, we will be able to stimulate growth and accommodate tomorrow's demand. For example, our consultant has projected that MIA's annual passenger cargo and flight operation volumes will grow by 75, 150% respectively in the next 20 years or so. Thanks to our long runways, MIA has virtually no delays due to airfield congestion. To maintain that level of performance, projections show our airfield capacity will have to be spanned um, by the year, uh, we'll have to span um, by the year 2040. Improved access to roads and highway system will also assure that the present surface modes of transportation, um, you know, keep, keep maintaining, maintaining us um, on, on the game. FDOTs, are they great or not? FDOTs, they're, they're just awesome. Um, the Northwest 25th Street Viaduct, an incredibly important project for us, I mean, keep in mind that we are uh, in, in the perishable, in the perishable business, and time is money. This this is a a, a project that um, being handled by DOT. The first phase was just finished uh, last year, and phase two is in the current work program uh, of the DOT. And finally, uh, some rail and sea infrastructure projects are in progress, and we are exploring other multimodal partnership. Um, uh, from rail and 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 sea cargo to to link it to to the airport. We we look forward to Miami Dade's Transit Airport link connection opening this summer uh, and FDOT's Miami Central Station opening next year. Isela will be discussing um, these um, features later on. Thank you. That that does it for me, Jeff. next in order, so <laughs> who is it? It's Kevin. Kevin? Kevin? Kevin?
Kevin Linsky with the Port of Miami. Hey, good morning, everybody. Ah, I got my own clicker. Good. Let's see if I can work it. Uh, my name is Kevin Linsky again. I do business development and help out with some of the planning at the Port of Miami. I always start off by saying I am not Bill Johnson. I know every time people go and, and want to see a show and really learn about the port and uh, get a lot of excitement, Bill's the man. So sometimes when you fill in from him, it's not the easiest thing in the, in the world. But it's an absolutely fantastic time to be working at the port. We've just finished our master plan. We have over $2 billion uh, of work that we think we'll accomplish in the next 10 to 15 years. And if you were to go out to the port today, it's almost a construction site. We have 530 acres. And we probably have, you know, 10% of it just uh, being chewed up right now with bulldozers and movers and tunnelers and everything that you can imagine. Uh, I have seven minutes to try to cover cargo crews and something really cool, which you, I bet you in the future, you know, we'll all be doing a lot more talking about, which is commercial development at the Port of Miami. So it, it's going to, I'm not going to do justice to any of it. Uh, and I don't even know how to work my slide. Here we go. So take a look at this, this port. Uh, you know, every time I sit next to Jose, he, he says how many jobs he produces and how much uh, uh, income he gives the state. And it stinks because I think I'm like number two or three. I, the port's two or three, and we always pale in comparison. But we produce about 180,000 jobs throughout the state, and it's assumed to be in about an $18 billion economic growth. And here's where I beat uh, Mr. Abreu. We do it on 530 acres which I just calculated thanks to my iPhone. I beat him on a statistic where we do 301 jobs per acre. So, <laughs> so I finally got him once. Uh, but we've got three big projects going on uh, now, all involving cargo, all kind of aimed at 2014. And I'm going to go through them really quickly. We've got uh, our partners here at the FEC Rail, I think, who can cover most of it. Um, our deep dredge program is back on schedule. As of Tuesday, our Board of County Commissioners uh, settled the environmental uh, administrative process. Um, we're going to let out an RFP, I think, in, in August. We will uh, be through with our deep dredge program, which is going to take us to 50 feet. Uh, we're in a race with the Panama Canal. We're, we're pretty much scheduled to complete right when they are. So we're very happy with that. It's a 150 to $180 million uh, job. Uh, we'd like to always thank the governor who stepped in last year. We were missing a little chunk of change, $77 million in the project. And the governor came in uh, and really within a month saw the value for the state and, uh, and with FDOT has invested money in that. Um, we also have two other projects. One's the tunnel. I'm going to get to that in a second. That's, uh, I think today they are on, every day we get a report on how deep they are into the project. Gus, what ring are they on? Uh, well, they're, I don't Set Minus, I don't know what that means, but we're minus 115, <laughs> and <laughs> I do know we're 1,783 feet along the first uh, path. We're well under the water, and we're, it's still holding up, so that's kind of good news. Uh, I, oh, well. If you guys ever get a chance to take a tour, hit Gus up. It's just absolutely fabulous. There's nothing else like it. Uh, we also have a great rail program. I'm going to leave that to our rail partners, and I should be flipping through some slides here. Uh, I want to talk about the tunnel just uh, for a second. It's, it's two tubes. The construction part's over $600 million. Uh, each tube will have two lanes of traffic. And uh, the project will come in between uh, 700 and 900 million. It's, it's a fully funded project. But kind of the neat thing about that is sometimes they say it takes a village to raise a kid. This isn't just a project. It has a 25-year history. And one day I hope somebody has the time to write the history of this project and what it's going to mean for the community. But I want to point out three people here, the, uh, Mr. Abreu, Mr. Pago, Alice Bravo, and there are a couple others in the room who absolutely have taken this project almost from the beginning. His history with this is incredible. And now, you know, the torch has kind of passed to Gus. And it's, you know, been great for our community. But more than just being a project, it's something that people every day have to uh, wake up to and work for and fight for. It had a political history, an engineering history, and now it has a construction history. But it's really just a fabulous project. Um, I think the tunnel, uh, the machine is going to pop out on port in July. They're going to pick it up, turn 400 feet of it around, and start it out the other way. And I believe it's more or less on schedule 
again for 2014. Uh, all three of our main projects that are designed around getting larger vessels uh, are on schedule for 2014. Um, we just completed our master plan. I'm going to uh, skip to cruise. Everything's, it's, it's a lot of fun to be at the port. When you look at the, <laughs> I just keep saying that, the, our projection uh, for cruise passenger growth is actually pretty modest. Right now we do around 4 million. We may do as many as 4.6 million passengers two years from now. Uh, we're on a little bit of a run here. But the projections for cruise for the South Florida market are probably a modest 1.5 to 2% growth per year for the next 20 years. And it's, it's not the, that people don't want to take more cruises here. It's that the demand for cruises is so high worldwide, it is sucking vessels out of the United States. Whereas the United States plateaued a couple of years ago and has been drifting back in terms of passengers because Europe and Asia, they're taking some of the ships. We've been very lucky in South Florida. We've maintained all of our traffic and even produced more. Uh, but the, the only limiter on this industry, if you have $600 million, I'll tell you exactly where to put it, is in a new ship. They can only pump out five or six ships a year. Every ship fills, goes with over 100% capacity. Nobody loses money. It's a pretty good business. Uh, and there's no reason why this business won't continue to grow at a great rate worldwide over the next uh, 20 years. It's got a great trajectory. But we're projecting a modest growth for our particular market. Um, we've got some neat challenges. And hopefully some people in this room will one day help us solve them. We're a small port. We look like a golf course. And the farther east you go, we have six major berths. And the formula is you put in a berth, you put in a cruise terminal, and then you plunk down a parking garage. Well, we've come to the end of the road. We've got six major berths. We have room for two more berths. But the terminals and parking garages aren't going to stack up the way they used to. And it's funny because innovation always comes out of problems. If you look at Hong Kong, they've got no space at all. And they do amazing things. So we're at the point where we're going to work with planners to create a first multi-terminal, really big guy, that's going to be able to serve three to four ships at once, and also completely look at the way we do parking. We'll probably end up with a multimodal center. Or it'll be a really interesting and fun design. It's going to uh, have a lot of planning and engineering and a whole bunch of money and the whole thing probably starts four or five years from now. But it's, it's a, well, my clicker stopped working, so. Um, so, you know, that project is, is a couple years away, but it's going to take a lot of planning and a lot of thinking that, you know, no one has done before. Well, what you can't see is a, there we go. Uh, these are, uh, some designs that other people have used around the United, not around the United States, around the world. Cruise terminals are getting far more interesting. They started off almost as warehouses, and now they're becoming architectural features. Um, I think one day in the future, uh, studies kicked off at the MPO to bring some sort of public transportation onto port. We're going to try to copy some of what was done at the airport, coming up with a multimodal system, uh, looking at how rail integrates with that. Uh, that is supposedly a hotel and office development and a uh, uh, part of an intermodal center. I can't figure it out, really, but it looks pretty neat. So I'm going to turn my attention to the third piece, which is really when I wake up in the morning these days, I used to think cargo, 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 and now I'm starting to think commercial, commercial, commercial. We have the southwest corner of the port, which is not suited for either of our two businesses, which are cargo and cruise. We cannot get a cruise ship back in that corner. We don't have the depths. And we can't put cargo containers in around existing office buildings. Uh, so Bermeo Ahimil that completed our master plan looked at that area and thought, wow, what a great spot to start a new uh, uh, venture, which is a third revenue stream for the port, which will be commercial development. We have about 36 acres, approximately 30 of it developable, that will one day hopefully house uh, a World Trade Center, a couple towers, a hotel, and uh, Alice Bravo loves the idea that we're going to do a marina right across uh, from the existing marina. This particular graphic attempts to put, I don't know which of these it might be. Oh, it's Monaco. We've got four or five of these. How you can create uh, an inner harbor for the city. So we're going through some efforts right now. We're going to bring on a master planner 
to figure out how we can best integrate with the city. We have an old bridge that's still in existence that could be used for pedestrian traffic or for public transportation. Uh, and they're just the possibilities are fantastic for the downtown. This is just a, a quick rendering of what that property could look like uh, when it's developed. But really, you know, we're not just going to take it to market to make the most money we can. That's kind of easy. It's a, it would, there'd be no effort to that. We're really going to spend our time working with downtown, with the waterfront, to figure out what is best for the community. We're going to preserve that waterfront. We're going to create a green space. And we're going to build a focal point for trade. I mean, those are our goals. And it's going to take a few years. It's going to be done in phases. But again, it's, just, it's exciting stuff. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. figure it out. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is David Anderton. I'm in charge of planning at Port Everglades. Um, as Jeff said earlier, I've been at the port for about 10 years and I've, I've watched uh, specifically on the containerized cargo side, the port grow immensely. Uh, containerized cargo volumes have uh, doubled in the 10 year period that I've been at Port Everglades. And um, with the development of our master plan uh, back in 2006, we have primarily focused on um, implementing cruise-related projects with some modest um, cargo development uh, in Southport, which is where we do the majority of our cargo. Um, our main focus now is three strategic projects that are related to cargo, and I'm going to quickly go through those three projects, but I'd like to lead off with some of our uh, basic overview of the facility. Second busiest multi-day cruise port, top seaport in Florida for international export trade, which is pretty significant. Um, I'm not sure uh, if the majority of the people in the room know, but not only Port Everglades, but Port Miami as well, a significant amount of export trade through Florida ports in addition to imports. Uh, number 12 in the United States for international container cargo trade. I was looking at some statistics yesterday from the American Association of Port Authorities and it listed 25 ports throughout the country with their fiscal year 11 uh, growth rates compared to 10 and Port Everglades was uh, the second on the list with an about uh, almost an 11.5 percent containerized cargo uh, increase over fiscal year 2010. The only port that was more significant than that was uh, actually the Port of New Orleans. We are a major distribution site for South Florida's gasoline and jet fuel. We supply the majority of um, gasoline for 12 counties in South Florida. We also provide aviation fuel via direct pipeline to the Port of Miami and Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. And we're an enterprise fund. We operate solely off of the revenue that we generate. Profits that we generate are pumped back into the facility because our main goal is job creation. And by, by pumping money back into the facility, implementing projects to increase business and accommodate the growth in business, uh, it's all about creating jobs. As you can see, fiscal year 11 uh, gross revenues, 139.2 million. Our gross revenues were up almost $15 million from fiscal year 10. Here is um, just a quick snapshot of fiscal year 11 results from the three business sectors. Cruise was up, three point, uh, up to 3.95 million passengers, an increase of 7.6%. A lot of that has to do with our agreement with Royal Caribbean and the two largest vessels in the world that we have at Port Everglades, the Oasis class vessels. Containerized cargo, again, up 11% to 881,000 TEUs. TEU is 20-foot equivalency unit. That's how we measure, measure containers. And petroleum uh, slightly down, which isn't a surprise. That kind of trends with our projections and our, in our planning efforts. Uh, vehicles are getting better gas mileage. Uh, the economic downturn, people aren't driving as much. So um, we, we actually are projecting that to be pretty flat over the next 15 years or so. Overall economic impact, because that's really what the focus of today is. And uh, Jose and, and Kevin both touched on it a little bit. Um, this is based on our, we, we just completed our fiscal year 11 overall economic impact study for the port. And you can see annually 160,000 jobs created throughout, throughout the state. Uh, direct local jobs, a little over 11,000. 
personal income of $5.9 billion, and when you look at the total value of economic activity, over $15 billion, which is significant. Everybody's heard about the Panama Canal and the expansion. Uh, the evolution of the container ships, as you can see, looking at the first generation in the 70s, trending towards uh, 2000 and beyond. Uh, the, the drafts of those vessels are located on the bottom. Uh, what's interesting today at Port Everglades, if you look at uh, the second from your, from your right, the 42 to 46 foot draft, those are post Panamax vessels. Those vessels currently call at Port Everglades today on a European service. Over the last year and a half, we've had about 80 calls of six different post Panamax vessels at Port Everglades. However, those vessels are coming in lightly loaded uh, due to the draft issues that we have at the outer and inner entrance channel. Let's talk about the three strategic projects that we're focused on right now from the cargo perspective. Uh, this is Southport at Port Everglades. Uh, you see berth 30 there running uh, east-west. That currently is a berth of about 900 feet in length. Uh, we are going to be expanding that facility to 2,400 feet in length, and that's going to provide us the ability to have five additional berths in the turning notch. Uh, based on our analysis, uh, and this will be constructed at the initial existing depth of 42 feet, uh, that additional capacity that will be generated by those additional bursts is, is about 730,000 TEUs. So um, the main thing that came out of our planning efforts is that we are berth deficient uh, on the cargo side. Um, not so much on the crew side. We have some length issues in terms of uh, our, our cargo, or excuse me, our cruise bursts. Uh, some of those, some of those berths do need to be longer in order to accommodate the larger cruise vessels. Um, but this is a significant project for the port. We're currently in design right now. There's some environmental mitigation uh, that's related to this project. We're going to be impacting about 8.7 acres of mangroves. But to offset that, we're going to be constructing about 16 and a half acre of mangroves adjacent to an existing conservation easement within the port. Our next project is the deepening and widening project. Uh, Kevin, Port Miami, obviously a little bit ahead of us, and, and we're happy to see that your project's finally moving forward. We think that's great. Um, we're, we're in the final throws with the Corps of Engineers on getting a draft study out for public comment. Uh, our project, it's about a $320 million project that will take, actually take our outer entrance channel to 57 feet, uh, and that's simply due to the fact that we've got severe cross currents that occur close to the entrance channel. And then as you get into the inner entrance channel and the rest of the, of the channels that lead towards Southport, it'll be taking it to 50 feet. Now what you see, the little green area there, that's the turning notch project that I was talking about. So we're moving forward with the expansion of the notch at the existing depth. When this project comes to fruition, the, the core will actually come in and deepen a portion of that turning notch to 50 feet to allow the birthing of a post Panamax vessel. And our third project is the Intermodal Container Transfer Facility. And this is an exciting project for us. Uh, we've worked very diligently with the Florida East Coast Railroad over the last year and a half or so to bring this project to fruition. I'm sure Mark's probably going to talk on this, touch on this project in a little more detail than me. But basically, this project is um, a $72 million project if you're just looking at the rail side. Uh, when you throw in the overpass project that the Department of Transportation is constructing, uh, it brings it to about a $125 million project. Um, the Department of Transportation is elevating our main ingress-egress point at Eller Drive, creating a bridge structure that will allow the intermodal uh, rail spur to come underneath, so that will maintain free flow access in and out of the port for containerized cargo and cruise passengers. And this is just a little bit more detail of, their, of this project. Um, this is going to be a state-of-the-art intermodal facility from FEC. This is the first um, near-dock intermodal facility of its size to be constructed on the East Coast in many, many years. And it will have the ability to, uh, to build unit trains within Port Everglades, in Southport, directly adjacent to our container cargo areas. And those unit trains will be able to leave uh, Port Everglades and service not only up to Jacksonville, but be, make connections in Jacksonville and service the southeastern United States. And we're very excited about this project. Uh, it's a public-private partnership. 
The state's provided uh, significant funds for the project. The FEC is, um, has, has a state infrastructure bank loan of about $30 million, and they're also uh, putting in cash equity. And the only contribution of the port is the land. Uh, we're, 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 we're contributing about 42 and a half acres of vacant land that we have in Southport that's valued at about $20 million. Economic impacts of these projects. Just quickly, um, if you look at construction impacts for the turning notch, over 2,000 jobs, projected 2029 annual business impacts, and, and these business impacts are tied to our projections and our master plan. You're looking at over 5,500 local and regional jobs and statewide jobs of over 106,000 just from the expansion of the notch, tied to those 730,000 additional TEUs that I talked about earlier. The deepening and widening program, again, uh, about 5,800 uh, 5, jobs uh, from the construction impact, and when you're looking at the business impact, 1,500 jobs and statewide jobs, about 30,000, and the intermodal container transfer facility from a construction perspective, over 700, and what, why that's highlighted in yellow is that um, the, the projections and the business impact for the intermodal facility are tied to the turning notch and the deepening and widening project. So all of these projects complement each other, um, and you can see the impacts for the ICTF, which are significant as well. Uh, to raise Florida's economy, you've got to dig deeper. Uh, we're, we're in the final throes, as I said now, with the Corps of Engineers, and really what it's all about, it's about creating jobs for the state, uh, for the region, and for, for the local area, and, and that's what we do. So with that, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I'm from the Florida East Coast, represent the private sector. So you've heard from our partners on the public side. So uh, a lot of the key things you hear, $30 million here, $50 million there, $100 million there, right? Holy cow. So um, our public partners have done a great job in the past uh, growing their business and looking towards the future. And with all the infrastructure investment that they're making in the future, they're obviously betting big. From the private sector, what we're seeing on the horizon is great opportunities for South Florida infrastructure. And that's why the private sector via FEC and through our connections and partnerships with our public partners down in South Florida are bidding big as well. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the future opportunities that we have and we think about in terms of growth, not just in Florida, but uh, throughout the southeast as the Panama Canal expansion moves towards completion. And again, uh, I think collectively we're all betting big on South Florida to continue as a trade, um, trade port and trade uh, gateway, both with Latin America and Asia in the future. And I'm hoping that uh, all of you invest and bet big on South Florida as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about Florida for some of you who may not uh, be abreast on some of the key economic statistics. Uh, but why a lot of investments being made in Florida, in Southeast Florida in particular, is our population and our consumption. So we're the fourth largest state economy in the U.S., 19 million permanent residents, but through uh, partnerships, through our ports, uh, through the cruise business, through our Central Florida partners on the theme park business, uh, of course all the Latin American uh, communities coming up through Miami and Fort Lauderdale each year on tourism. Uh, there's a lot of out-of-state consumption happening. So that makes Florida a huge consumption market. And coming from the retailer side of the view, Florida always remains one of the top two, three, four states in terms of store penetration because it has so much GDP, because it has so much consumption power going towards it. And uh, the great part about Florida is that it has great infrastructure. So we have three of the top 15 or 16 uh, container ports uh, throughout the country. And uh, through the Florida East Coast, we have the uh, inland infrastructure to support transportation uh, throughout the state as well. A bit about FEC. So, uh, you know, we're just uh, a small regional railroad, but uh, we have a big and wide and diverse and integrated customer base. So we serve as retailers directly. So we actually make a lot of store deliveries to the stores uh, that are coming from the retailers' distribution centers. So they'll typically drop their freight off in Jacksonville. Uh, they'll utilize the FEC to bring their freight down south. And then uh, from our ramps down south, we'll make the store deliveries uh, to their retail locations. 
Uh, we obviously support the manufacturing community. They, they move their goods to the retailers directly as well. And we also have key customers within the other transportation modes throughout the state of Florida. So key trucking companies are our customers, UPS, the big over-the-road trucking companies who also support the retailers. And of course, on the ocean side, uh, many of the largest uh, ocean carriers in the world. A little bit about our infrastructure. So when you look at the state of Florida, we're the red line running up and down the East Coast. We're a 351 mile mainline track going from Miami up to Jacksonville. Um, from Jacksonville, for those shippers who have a need to either uh, have their freight originate or finalize inside or outside the state of Florida, the FEC has partnerships with the other two key class one railroads, the Norfolk Southern and CSX to allow uh, out-of-state uh, transportation needs for our customer base. About 80% of our traffic today, unit traffic today, is intermodal volume. The other 20% uh, being carload type of volume, which is moving things like coal, uh, fuel, and even automobiles. And again, we have ramps throughout uh, the state of Florida along the East Coast, so it's just not uh, two points throughout the state between Jacksonville and Miami, but we also have connection points and ramps in Central Florida and South Florida as well. <clears throat> A little bit about our inland network uh, again. So you can have growth and trade and be able to bring your goods, containerized goods, through either Port Everglades or Port Miami, but unless there's an efficient uh, from both a transit time basis as well as a cost-effective basis, inland transportation mode, uh, shippers aren't going to utilize these trade routes. And that's where the FEC comes into place. And we're very, very competitive. And that's why um, it allows us to further penetrate the southeast besides just Florida. So we can go from Miami, uh, Everglades, up to North Florida being Jacksonville and South Georgia overnight. It's a nine-hour commute. We're a scheduled railroad. We run multiple trains going northbound and southbound daily, which gives the shippers flexibility. Uh, but we can also hit key population markets like Atlanta and Charlotte on the second morning service. So that can be as good or better than truckloads. So when shippers of the world, like the Home Depots, Office Depots, Walmarts of the world, look at the ports down South Florida as potential entry points, they want to look at transit times and reliability of that transit. And when you look at the FEC network, we're certainly able to provide that for our shipping community. <clears throat> so. You probably know this, but uh, take a look at this map. So um, we're a big country in terms of geography, but our population is very um, centric in a lot of key areas. So there's 10 what they call mega regions throughout the, throughout the uh, country, and two of those are in the southeast. Obviously, you can see Florida um, down here is one of those key mega regions, but you also have this mega region right here, which is inclusive of Atlanta. And this is really where all of us should be interested. So. I think somebody mentioned earlier, I think it was Jeff, that a lot of our uh, consumed import freight doesn't actually originate from a Florida port. I think the statistic last time I heard is a little bit over 50% of imported goods that are consumed in the state of Florida actually don't originate through a Florida port. That, that's a ton of market share for us to have, to have the opportunity to capture. So that's why we're particularly focused on investing in infrastructure and seizing the opportunity to service 50% of the imported goods in this huge population center that we call Florida and that we call home, but also further reaching into this second mega population area that's uh, existing today and will grow in the future, which is other parts of the Southeast. And that's why um, we started a new Central Florida service via the FEC. It's called the Beeline Express. So typically, we never service the Central Florida market for imports coming in through uh, South Florida ports. And um, again, there's a lot of distribution centers located in Central Florida. And those were typically being serviced by alternative ports like Savannah, primarily. We want to recapture that market share. So as of the beginning of this year, we opened up a ramp in Cocoa. So importers are allowed to bring in their freight through South Florida. We'll rail it up to Central Florida via our cocoa ramp and then do a short truckload dray from, Central, from our cocoa ramp into Central Florida. So we aim to recapture a lot of this market share that has been going into alternative ports, and we've already seen some early success. So we just opened the ramp uh, first quarter of this year, 
and uh, a large retailer who has a large distribution center in Orlando. Uh, they used to, or they currently import uh, over 6,000 TEUs of freight into the Orlando distribution center. All of that was coming through Savannah. Uh, they recently went through an RFP. We proposed that they bring it through uh, Port Miami and utilize the FEC into Central Florida and Central Florida and, and the Miami seaports and uh, the Ocean Cure is awarded over two thirds um, of that business. So a huge switch early on and a potential game changer uh, as we look to spread that word and do the marketing and make people aware that we're faster, we're cheaper through South Florida into Central Florida versus alternative out of state ports. So another key thing, so uh, the South Florida ports have always been a, a key trade gateway with the North-South trade, the Latin American trade, and it will continue to be so in the future. But with the expansion of the Panama Canal coming at the end of 014, beginning of 015, Port Miami uh, moving forward with its 50-foot dredge, Port Everglades uh, nearing the stage of uh, prepping for their uh, submission as well. A key growth area post-canal expansion is going to be uh, the Asian trade cargo. So again, today the South Florida ports are mostly known for a lot of their Latin American trade. Uh, in the future that will continue, but you're going to see a lot more Asian trade, and that's a lot of TEUs and containers. They're currently, again, being serviced by alternative ports like Savannah and Charleston. The key point here is these two ports aren't approved to go to 50 feet, requires hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to get there, and they're continually fighting with each other over the last 15, 20 years because neither one of them wants the other to get the advantage because there they're, they're are two ports that share the same river port. So if one gets it and the other doesn't, it puts them at a competitive disadvantage. So we're hoping for selfish reasons um, that these two continue to fight and allow the opportunities to bring the bigger cargo ships through South Florida. So again, today, here's Atlanta. Here's Central Florida, here's Miami. Again, going back to that slide a couple slides ago, huge population centers here, tons of consumption. A lot of retailers put their DCs in Atlanta, a little bit south of Atlanta and Orlando to service this whole market, right? So we see as the bigger cargo vessels allowed, are allowed to traverse the canal, and those bigger vessels bring economies of scale with them. And those economies of scale will eventually allow them to allow better and a more attractive pricing to the retailers of the world to call on ports that are allowed to discharge their bigger vessels like Port Miami, but not Savannah and Charleston. So again, when, when retailers are looking to save money throughout their supply chain, having an opportunity to take a couple hundred dollars of cost out of the shipping costs by bringing a bigger vessel to discharge in South Florida versus other ports, it's gonna swing the pendulum on the overall service and cost equation to bring your freight through South Florida to service South Florida, Central Florida, and the Southeast versus these traditional ports in the South Atlanta, South Atlantic. So as you can see in this chart over here today, when you compare the Atlanta market and ability to service that Atlanta market and Port Miami here, they're approved for 50 feet. Moving forward with it, they'll be able to accommodate the 9,000 plus TU vessels, which they call the Super Post Pamex vessels. Um, overall time to market, we're going to be faster to Atlanta than Savannah. So you look at the geography, you say, well, how can, we, how can you get a container from Miami up into Atlanta faster than Savannah can? And part of that reason is because on the ocean vessel string, if they do make an additional stop and there's an additional transit time to go from Miami to Savannah, by the time that ship actually discharges in Savannah, via the FEC and our connecting partners through Jacksonville, we can actually have that container at that distribution center's door before it actually leaves the port of Savannah. So we'll have a time to market advantage as well. And as I talked about uh, operating expense ratios, being able to bring a larger fully laden vessel to a South Florida port will bring operating expense efficiencies for the ocean cargo carriers which we believe eventually will trickle down and cascade down to the savings to the retailers and the shippers who bring their import containers. And again, make South Florida a more attractive option for Asian import cargo. So um, just to recap, um, I think we've actually talked about two of these three projects that um, FEC is uh, invested in. 
You have the on-dock rail at Port of Miami. Uh, we'll begin operations at that, projected towards the fall of this year, hopefully in uh, Q3 of 2012, so we'll be able to actually build uh, block load trains straight off the port onto our main line going northbound Jacksonville and beyond. And again, why that's important to everybody is it makes the transit system a lot more efficient. So today, uh, imports, containers have to discharge from the port, be truckload drayed from the port to our Hialeah ramp, and then go northbound from there. By having on-dock, near-dock rail, it will actually be able to take the containers straight onto our main line and go north versus having to do that extra step. So it takes time and cost out of the equation, um, which is very important to everybody. Um, of course, um, David just talked about the on-dock ICTF that we're in partnership with Port Everglades at, and a $73 million public-private partnership with expected completion in 2014, first quarter. So we've talked a, uh, quite a bit about you know, what's going on in terms of the airport, the seaport, and its ability, the FEC's investment to do the inland transportation. But the one thing we haven't talked about is another key cog in, in the overall wheel for the, for the supply chain network for shippers is the distribution side of the house. And uh, that's why we're trying to get the word out to all of you is you're going to have all this extra cargo coming through these gateways down here. That cargo, in many cases, will move directly uh, throughout the state of Florida and beyond. But in many, many cases, that cargo is going to need to be transloaded. It's going to need to be reworked, labeling. Um, with FTZ designation, there's advantages to using Miami and uh, Everglades as a hub in the future. So that's why we believe there's going to be a demand and need for incremental distribution space in the future. So recognizing that, um, our partners at Flagler, we're already moving forward with a key project that we've titled the South Florida Logistics Center. Uh, it's owned and being developed by Flagler Development. Uh, the key part within the overall intermodal system is it's co-located with the existing FEC Hialeah rail yard. And um, at this time, approximately, we'll offer up to 1.5 million square feet of multi-purpose dry temperature controlled warehousing space. And again, the key there is it's connected to the transit system. So it's adjacent to the rail yard. Our rail yard's connected to Port Everglades, Port Miami, and it's also adjacent to, Port, uh, to the Miami International Airport as well. So having distribution space as close to your other transportation nodes and modes is very, very important from a shipper's perspective. Because anytime you have to sit in traffic and move it from one point to another in that intermodal system, it's time and money, and nobody wants to spend extra money. So again, uh, just a close up, um, the project uh, is set to commence uh, later this summer with potential operations beginning early next year. Um, expected to have FTZ designation and uh, really ideal for import deconsolidation and transload services. And again, because typically on the transloading deconsolidation of containers into 53 foot domestic equipment, you're gonna have to do $150, $250 dray from that facility back to our rail yard being co-located and connected to our rail system, you don't have to spend that money in the future. And a couple hundred dollars per container per inland move is absolutely huge when you start talking about these large retailers who are moving tens of thousands of containers per year. Everybody's fight, fighting for an extra one or, per two, one or two percent savings every year, and trust me, those are hard to get because you're trying to offset increase, increase in costs like fuel expenses. So every retailer supply chain is trying to find money taking $150, $200 out of the cost equation is huge. And just to give you um, a little bit of highlight of how all of that's connected, um, just an aerial view, and, and it's really a, a unique situation down in South Florida, because I've done a little bit of research on the internet. Can't be, this isn't factual for sure, but I believe there's no other network throughout the country in terms of transportation infrastructure that, ha that is this well connected and has this much geographical proximity to each other. So you have the Port Miami right here to the right in the orange rectangle. The purple line jutting out of it represents our on-dock rail project, uh, again, which will allow our containers to go northbound on our main line straight from the pier. And again, if you have international cargo that needs to be reworked um, at the logistics center or other distribution centers. We'll have shuttle service uh, that goes straight to our intermodal facility and or the logistics center, and again, which is co-located and adjacent to the Miami International Airport. So again, all the key infrastructure connected via rail, 
highway system. You have distribution here. You have airport. You have seaport. You have rail. Uh, quite a unique situation. So. Um, obviously, from a development point of view, you want to find development space that's connected um, to your key transportation modes. And typically, it's going to either be to highway or rail that connects you to the seaports or airports. And um, that's what I have. Well, Talk about the big three and now the big four. Adding that private sector element is certainly um, answers a lot of questions uh, that us planners have in trying to figure out this build it, will they come or when are they coming and what do we need to build? Um, I have prepared some leading questions for the panel. We have until 10.30 for a question and answer period. For those of you at the tables that may have questions, if you simply write them down, and raise your hand. Um, there are some folks who come around and bring the questions up to me. Um, we've heard a lot about infrastructure and infrastructure needs and infrastructure under construction. <clears throat> are there any non-infrastructure changes that could assist you in meeting challenges and leveraging opportunities? And I'm talking about um, the lack of resources for customs, um, regulation amendments that perhaps you know, some of us local and at the state level might be able to um, get amended. So with that, I'm just going to open the question to anybody uh, at the table. David? Well, uh, from a non-infrastructure perspective, Jeff, I think that um, the support of the federal government from U.S. Customs and Border Protection is critical. Um, given the amount of growth that's projected not only at Everglades, Miami, but other ports uh, throughout, throughout the state and throughout the country for that matter, it's very important that uh, the federal government, Congress, steps up to the plate with adequate funding levels for Customs and Border Protection, not only on the containerized cargo inspection side, but also on the cruise terminal passenger processing side. I think that's uh, very important. Anybody want to add? Um, I've just received a question that is very similar to one of the questions that we had prepared. And, uh, you know, the six pillars, the first pillar referred to talent and education. Um, you know, do you see any current or projected voids where um, skilled labor force uh, are not available? And, and not just at the skilled labor level, I think we could, I've frequently taken uh, engineers, new engineers at District 4 over to the port to show them how significant the port is to our economy. You know, one of our um, tours, Phil Allen indicated that the uh, crane operators make more than he does. They make over $200,000 a year. Learn from the longshoremen, they need to go to Baltimore to get trained. Um, vocational training, skilled labor training, development of customs documents. Um, do you all see that there's some sort of a void and, and the need for uh, expanded uses at the Florida educational um, facilities and vocational facilities to bring on labor to fill the um, void that may be coming our way? <laughs> uh, so, um I, I wouldn't, uh, just personal view versus a fact, I, I wouldn't view it as a, a perception of uh, a lacking of infrastructure in terms of, in terms of skilled people to service our project because, you know, while we'd like to employ uh, local, uh, you know, personnel who uh, have spent time and invested uh, down in South Florida, there's skilled labor nationwide and, and really it's more of a call to action to the South Florida uh, universities and, and vocational schools um, to really focus on offering those skill sets and drawing attention and focus to it to the younger generation so that we can keep it within the South Florida family versus going out of state uh, to recruit those professionals to come in to do work that should be uh, being deployed to uh, local graduates throughout our network and systems. 
And just, you know, one good thing about our industry in Florida, uh, it's the highest paying for someone who doesn't have a college education. I think the number has come out that the typical person in logistics in Florida makes $55,000. And if you ever look, I, normally between eight and a half, nine and a half percent of the U.S. gross domestic product is logistics. And if you look where it's really spread out, it's a lot of truck driving and warehousing. And there's that top two to three percent that are really in the logistics science. Uh, but for the most part, when, when we add up the jobs that we help create in Florida, uh, we don't find a, a, a gap. I mean, we, we really have the ability to, to find workers. And, and on top of that, I mean, uh, our institutions are beginning to realize yeah. how the whole uh, um, concept, if you will, of, of logistics uh, work. For example, Miami Day College is, is looking into maybe offering a, a bachelor's degree in, in these kinds of things, and FIU is all over it. So I wouldn't use the, the word um, the void, um, but uh, I think we're certainly getting there. Yeah, and just just to add to that, I agree as well. I think you know all of the Florida ports through the Florida Ports Council has done a. a really a fantastic job, especially over the last, you know, five years or so of educating the business community and the general public on the importance of the seaports. Kevin mentioned, you know, the fact that the jobs at the seaports are, are very uh, high paying jobs uh, without the need necessarily for a college education or even a high school diploma for that matter. Um, at Port Everglades, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, we, we make a effort to give tours to, um, you know, high schools, uh, universities, uh, Arlene Davis, I think here is here, my staff, she's over the last probably couple months has had a couple universities come in where we've given tours. Uh, and it's always enlightening to see uh, these folks for the first time who may be at a port to, to actually to see them realize what all the different things that are actually occurring at the facility and the potential opportunities that are there for employment. Um, I think some of the vocational opportunities, I think some of the vocational schools, there, there could be an opportunity to bolster some of their curriculum. Um, we do work with Broward College. They have a supply chain and logistics program, and we work with them on that program. And as of, uh, actually, as of yesterday, we just met with Kaiser College because they're, they're looking at uh, implementing some, some supply chain and logistic chain programs themselves. Thank you all. Um, you know, just personally, uh, I've been very lucky when I came to DOT in 1998. On uh, my job description was this 5% seaport coordinator, and it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, it was not in my career plans. I don't know how many of you all, when you were in high school, thought, oh, I'm going to be a seaport director or an airport director. Uh, the more exposure at the high school levels, uh, getting the best and the brightest in this industry can only bring more um, uh, trade to the South Florida area and just um, increase this as our economic base. Jose, I have a, a question for you. Port of Miami, green lanes, what are these? I'm not sure I heard that mentioned, but did you? Did somebody want Port to? Port of um, Miami? Yeah, it says, oh, Port of Miami, I'm sorry, Kevin, green lanes, what are these? Wow, you should tell us what the questions are before we come here. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, this, came, <laughs> this is completely unfair. Uh, so, so here's the thing. We, as a port, uh, produce one million truck movements just for our cargo. We produce hundreds of thousands on the cruise side. 70% uh, of these trucks are looping back and forth to the warehousing districts and coming back in. You can do three, three and a half loops a day. The gate system, the gate interchange, is pretty uh, primitive. Uh, it's changing all around the country, but it has not changed here yet. If you took the amount of time that a trucker sits in queue trying to get to a container, I'm embarrassed to say what that number might be, and I'm not going to say it, but he's burning gas. It's a buck a minute to sit there and burn the gas, and it makes no sense. So uh, we have a planning effort that's underway now to completely redo our gate system. Um, and in conjunction with the tunnel, uh, we are probably going to, embed some technology into our main entrances. And these, these little boxes are nothing anymore. When we first started five years ago, it was a, a kind of a big system, a gantry system, and now they're just little tiny boxes where you will be able to come into the port and give five critical pieces of information electronically, come up to a, a gate system that knows you're coming there, 
and you'll probably even just use a Twix card or your thumb and you're on your way. And it's kind of shocking the amount of time, of uh, trucker's time that you save and the amount of fuel that you save and the carbon footprint. But a green lane is nothing more than don't stop the guy and make him sit in a line. Uh, just add a little bit of technology and away you go. You mean like SunPass? <laughs> yeah, like SunPass. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, a question from the audience. Will the 1.5 million square feet of distribution space for FEC South Florida Logistics Center be adequate for foreseeable future needs? Is any consideration being given to finding more um, capacity? So just for, for clarification, um, the project is uh, owned and being developed by our sister company, Flagler. Uh, we used to be part of the uh, same organization. Uh, once our company was bought by Fortress Equity, um, they split the two companies apart. So we're still very much connected in terms of partnerships and collaboration, but it is being developed by Flagler. But um, again, that's, you know, that's existing land that's been owned by the railroad for a long time and hasn't been taken advantage of. And with the advent of all the increased cargo that we expect to come through uh, South Florida as a gateway, now is the opportune time to begin prepping that distribution space because it's a gap. And by no means is that 1.5 million square feet nearly adequate enough. And I'm not the expert out here, but I would probably say occupancy rate in the uh, Miami-Dade Broward area on industrial space is probably uh, in the mid-90s, if, if I had to guess. So already with today's slower economy, um, you know, you're reaching capacity in terms of uh, warehouse industrial space. Uh, and with the influx of growth, um, on particularly on imports. Now remember, you know, our country is expected to grow 2 3% over the next uh, five years or so unless something changes. But imports as a percent of our GDP is, continue, is expected to grow 5 6 7%. So again, imports will become a bigger and bigger part of our daily consumption uh, as far as projections goes. And when you talk about import-exports, and you add to that that South Florida is a good natural gateway for it, you're going to need a lot more distribution space. So, um, you know, Long answer to that question is it's not nearly enough, and that's why um, we're here, I'm here, uh, to embark upon uh, trying to get you all to partner with us to make those infrastructure investments so that, again, we can continue to offer a full service solution to the shipping community who wants to utilize South Florida as a gateway. I'd just like to hop in. We're spending more and more time as a port uh, looking off port. It's really what's going on inland that's becoming a lot more important to us. And it's taken me a couple months to kind of understand a decent answer to that question. Not that I'm not saying that wasn't a good, that was a perfect one, but just a numerical answer. If you looked at Miami-Dade County, you would expect that we, we would have 40 square feet per person of warehousing. That's a very traditional number that you would find if you flattened America. Uh, Miami-Dade County has 70 square feet. We do things that almost no other community does. We are, serve as the warehousing districts for Central America and the Caribbean. We do tremendous uh, amount of, uh, of good flow. Um, when you see the development that's coming on, which is going to be perfectly situated at the FEC, uh, this isn't a, a, a I can't say that uh, this is a perfect number, but if you have 40 thousand new TEUs, which are these are these twenty foot standard measures, and you pump them through a port, you would expect one million square feet of additional warehousing. If you look at the flow from Port Everglades and us, uh, that's about maybe one year's growth, this one and a half mil million square feet of what we hope to gain at our port. So that our community has 150 million square feet now. Uh, and, you know, we could have a, a nice 1 to 2, 2% 2 growth in that for the next 10 years. So it is not enough. And just to, just to add to that, um, you know, inland logistics facilities has been kind of a hot, hot topic over the last three to five years. Um, you know, obviously they need to be market driven. I think there is some opportunity. Uh, up near Lake Okeechobee, areas, areas up uh, west of Palm Beach for ILCs. I think the legislature, uh, you know, taking the governor's lead and, and the secretary, uh, Anant, um, 
there's some legislation that passed this year where they're providing incentives for not only the development of these of these logistics facilities but also the connections uh, the connections are critical right now some of the locations have good infrastructure in place but I believe the majority of them do not and obviously you need to have obviously probably good rail connections to make those types of facilities work but I do think that the legislature took a took a step in the right direction by creating an incentive for that this year in, in, in the session I have another question from the audience, and this goes to Port of Miami and MIA. Um, you talked about Port of Miami FEC connections. How about MIA to Port of Miami connections? And I recall from Jose's, he showed that there would perhaps be the uh, connection from the MIC to Kevin uh, Terminal on the port. But then it goes on to say more intermodal cargo. So um, perhaps connectivity between MIA and the port cargo-wise? Well, uh, well, certainly, certainly there is a connectivity now, uh, uh, and they're called uh, cruise passengers, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, from, <Human> cargo. <laughs> from, from the cargo perspective, uh, it, it's a bit uh, uh, different. Yeah. Uh, I, I got to say that uh, air cargo um, is usually a heck of a lot more expensive than, than maritime uh, cargo. Um, it, it does not make a lot of sense for a, a carrier to pay the cost of air cargo only to then transfer it to, to the seaport or the other way around. Right now, that percentage of, of connectivity between the two ports in terms of cargo is, is in the 1% or 2% uh, range. But we're obviously not ruling out uh, the possibility of, of, of that kind of growth. And as the gentleman explained, you know, we're looking at rail to be, uh, you know, a player in, 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 in that form. Thank you, Jose. Um, another question from the audience. Um, is manufacturing in South Florida increasing? Um, what are the ratios between imports and exports? But how, how can we leverage um, the businesses that you're in into developing a manufacturing economic base in Florida, is it plausible? Well, uh, to, to, to begin with, um, uh, and, and I got to say, it, 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 it isn't bragging when, when it is true. I, I think that the Miami International uh, Airport model, uh, you know, as far as um, being an economic engine, um, is, is, is really extraordinary. and. Um, and you think about it, it's not um, necessarily the infrastructure uh, that we do have. For example, four, four runways in the middle of downtown, uh, I mean, in the middle of downtown Miami, really. Uh, infrastructure certainly helps. I mean, the refrigerating, uh, for example, warehousing that, that, that we do have uh, for the perishable uh, business. All that is, is, is key. But what makes this different is, is really the marketplace it's not even the way I dress, although I think it helps, you know. But <laughs> but but it, but it, it definitely it is definitely um, uh, the, the the private industry investment in, in that entire area around uh, you know Doral. They do exist because of us, and we do exist because of them. And, and so that is why it's not so easily uh, duplicated. So if you let the market be the market, uh, you know all, all those things will be, uh, 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 you know, those things will be uh, worked out. And, and, and of course the logistics, you know, from Hellman's logistics to UPS, you know, serving uh, the airport, is that synergy. No government could ever invest that kind of money to make something like that work. With all that's been said, um, you know, transportation planners, we have traditionally been reactive to providing infrastructure for projected population, projected consumption. Um, entering and particularly looking at the, the second directive from the uh, Florida Chamber study, attracting new trade, trade that would go through Florida and not be associated with the population or consumption in Florida. Um, do you have any suggestions for alternative ways to plan 
so that we can um, be ready. And I think the second bullet that um, Juan had put up, let's not build it when they come, let's build it, build it and will they come, but how do we build it when they're coming? Well, one of the things to think about when you look at your planning horizons out into the future is, uh, again, imports is a large, you know, it's been a, a huge um, driver towards, um, you know, the percent of GDP consumption over the last 10 years. And it will slow down a little bit uh, in terms of the growth rate, but it will continue to rise as a percent of consumption. Um, and historically, over the last five or 10 years, we've, we associate imports with China, right, and Asia. Um, but with that economic boom and the rising middle class in China, uh, wages are going up in China. And so manufacturers are looking for alternative places um, to invest uh, their manufacturing plants uh, to produce cheaper goods uh, in terms of uh, the labor costs. So Asia's uh, really been a benefactor over the last few years, but it's continually changing all the time based on what the local labor costs are. And what you're seeing to now as a trend is you know, you hear a little bit of buzzwords about near sourcing, which means bringing the manufacturing process closer to the consumption, i.e. the United States. And uh, we're hearing uh, examples of a lot of near sourcing, even in apparel, uh, happening in the Caribbean and Latin America versus typically Asia. And again, the more near sourcing that happens in Latin America, Caribbean, logically, uh, the more sense it makes to continue to utilize South Florida infrastructure uh, as an import-export gateway. So again, think about where your manufacturing source um, is shifting towards in the future and whether or not South Florida uh, will be a key trade line as part of that shifting um, manufacturing source. Strictly from a planning transportation planning perspective. I think it's very, very important that, you know, each county down here has its own MPO. Um, I, don't, I don't see Greg. I think he walked out of the room. I've been having some conversations with Greg Stewart, the executive director, over the last few months about uh, the need, I think, to, to develop some sort of technical advisory committee from, from a freight and goods movement perspective at the, at the Broward MPO. They're getting ready to move forward with their next uh, round of their freight and goods movement study. And given the projected growth, I think it's critical, you know, Kevin talked a little bit about, you know, the technology that they're going to be implementing from the gate perspective. I think it's, it's very critical um, that we start to look at technological innovations to allow freight to move freely and move um, not to hinder passenger movement, but so they both can move together. And I think the department's taken some steps in the right direction with managed lanes, uh, reversible lanes on 595 is another project that comes to mind. But I think there are other technological innovations that are out there that we need to start looking at. I know the West Coast is currently uh, looking at some pilot projects that they're doing out in California. And I think uh, the East Coast needs to take a good hard look at those types of projects and that we can learn from them. And we need to start thinking about it now. We can't wait. We need to not only look at them, but we need to really take a good hard uh, look at, at implementing them and prioritizing those types of projects, not just at the county level, but at a regional level. Because, you know, look, cargo that leaves Miami is going to go through Broward, it's going to go through Palm Beach. So it can't, you can't just be in a silo looking at these types of things. It has to be more of a regional, cohesive effort. You know, alluding back to Mark's presentation when he talked about Charleston and Savannah going back and forth and they're pretty much in limbo. And when David stepped forth and congratulated the Port of Miami on their deep dredging, I mean, it, that shows that supporting each other and going back to my opening on the team effort. You know, we are separate, we have overlaps, but when we work together as a team, we can get that bigger and better world domination and topping the competition thing that I was talking about. <laughs> you, you're you absolutely know. right. May I say something? Go right you're absolutely ahead, right. I, I used to say, you know, when I worked at, uh, at DOT that, that um, you, you know, the region is really the state. I mean, we're not the United Airports of America, the United uh, Counties of America, the United MPOs of America. We are the United States of America. And so we all need to pull that rope the same direction. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have uh, one more question, and then maybe perhaps we'll open it to the audience for another 10 minutes, but um, I, this alludes to 
um, the regional question, but looking beyond that, you know, do you believe, um, you know, what do you believe your region to be, but more importantly, do you see significant transportation system deficiencies that should be addressed together on a more regional, but maybe even a global basis? No deficiencies, wow. What will that do to our work program? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think I kind of touched on that in my response to the last yeah. question. Um, you know, I think um, not necessarily deficiencies. You can always look at level of service and things like that. But I think it's really, it's really um, about, about thinking out of the box, coming up with innovative ways to allow freight and people to move together at the same time. And I think that's really the future and what we really need to be focusing on right now. Well, even though it uh, doesn't benefit us um, at the FEC, you know, highway infrastructure, right? So, you know, you hear, um, you know, a lot of news press that uh, we're se severely underfunded in terms of our uh, highway infrastructure and the need for improvements there. And, you know, you all live it every day, looking at the traffic, trying to move throughout South Florida on the highway network system. So, uh, you know, to David's point, it's, it's passengers, it's uh, commuters utilizing that infrastructure, but it's also freight utilizing it via uh, truckload carriers. So, again, we want to continue to make our region very attractive. Uh, for business and uh, congestion on our highway system uh, tends to uh, be a negative to it that people look at. So, yeah, and, and again, that's why we have a, an agenda including freight, transit, congestion management, and, and most of our facilities here in South Florida are built we're from right of way line to right of way line, and managing what's in between is extremely important. You know, Mark, I want to say that. Uh, Mark is from the logistics side of the house and not involved in the passenger rail project. I got three questions here about passenger rail, but I think hearing from the FEC and understanding that we need to rationalize those corridors, both for freight and utilize for passenger, is something that we need to work out on a regional level. And perhaps you know those uh, deficiencies that we were, I was alluding to are on the management side and, and that layer of transit that we'll need in South Florida so that we can grow another 20 or 30 percent and relying on what we have now, you can only manage so much. Um, any other questions from the audience? David, do you think we can break a little bit early for, I'm uh, looking for David for break? All right, what time are we supposed to be back? Thank you all, 15 minutes.